These videos provide general information. They are not intended to replace consultations with a health care professional or to provide medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health care provider for particular concerns you may have. Never disregard professional health care advice or delay in seeking it because of the information on these videos. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming again, and um, we appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. You're always fabulous with your introductions. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, had considered coming tonight and discussing with you the brain. So there's a picture of the brain. There's sheet after sheet after sheet of all the functions. And here's a PowerPoint that I did for the Optometric Society of the Human Empire, all about the brain. But I thought that would be really boring, and that perhaps we could make it a little more interesting, which we can. So instead, I'm going to discuss with you improving the link between vision and brain processing. Because, um, uh, first of all, let me say that I don't like working with a PowerPoint because you flash it up on the screen, and then just when you think you might write it down or are interested in it, it's gone. So I have uh, this banner because um, it, uh, it stays up there. So if you want to write something down, you can, and I can discuss things about it. So the first thing here is, what do people with traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, stroke, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, genetic disorders, acquired brain dysfunction, what do they all have in, uh, in common? They all have problems with balance, posture, and movement. So how does the Parkinson's patient walk? Usually with a walker. Uh, like this. How does the stroke patient walk? Usually like this. What is it that causes these postural warps when there is some type of um, injury to the brain? Well, that's the problem. Now, why is peripheral vision relevant to these problems? Because there are two things going on in the brain. There is central vision and peripheral vision. And when there is some type of an impact to the brain, we lose our peripheral vision. Um, our brain represents, uh, misrepresents reality if there is an imbalance between central vision and peripheral vision. So I'm going to say that again. The brain misrepresents reality if there is a problem, an imbalance between what we call focal vision, which is your central vision, and ambient vision, which is your peripheral vision. So I'm going to tell you about some of my patients who um, who, who have these problems so that you can understand what happens because it's this mismatch between central vision and peripheral vision that makes the stroke vision, the stroke patient lean like this. It, it's his vision. It isn't his muscles. And, and it's the mismatch between central and peripheral vision that makes the Parkinson's patient lean like this. It isn't a problem with his muscles. Um, I had a patient who was a tennis player. I mean, just for fun. He played tennis. He liked tennis. And uh, last August, 
he had a surgical accident. They were going after some polyps in his nose, and they um, they snipped uh, an artery that went uh, to the back of the eye, believe it or not. Not the inside of the eye, but the outside of the eye. But when this artery broke, it engorged the area behind the eye with blood, and it pushed the eye forward. This pushing of the eye forward um, uh, caused the optic nerve, which runs from the brain to the retina, to snap, and he went blind in that eye. So uh, the retinal specialist called me and asked me if I could help him. And uh, he had one eye at this point, and this had just occurred like two weeks earlier. And the, I don't, the retinal specialist who I work with is passionate too. You talk about passionate, he really cares. And I said, uh, well, what's his complaint? Because what would you expect? I was waiting to hear, well, he's mad as hell because he only has one eye. He wants to kill the surgeon. Or um, how about he's having trouble driving? He can't see uh, the periphery on this side. Or I don't know, he's having trouble feeding himself, pouring the milk into his glass or coffee or whatever. No, you, you better just lie down on the floor because you're never going to believe what his complaint was. It was that he couldn't hit the ball when he hit tennis, <laughs> when he played tennis, and that's what he was mad about. So I examined him, and now you have to realize that his whole life he had two eyes, and what we call the center of the visual midline was right here in front of his nose. Now that he had one eye, his visual midline was here in front of his, his, this eye because this represented his field of vision. So the midline was here. So I just took a prism, prism and moved the midline back over here. Then I went with him to the tennis court and he took an automatic ball thrower out of his trunk. And we went into the tennis court and he plugged it in and he stood there and he hit every ball that came to him with prism because I moved space and I moved it back to where he had had it. And that's the problem with, with all these visual injuries. Uh, another patient I saw many years ago was a six-year-old boy by the name of Lonnie and he was brought to me uh, because he had been labeled by the school unable to learn. He could not even learn his colors. And he cried on the way to my office from the San Fernando Valley because um, his two brothers had seen a horse and the car was past the horse before Lonnie could find it visually. So um, the, the underlying problem was uh, called nystagmus, which means that his eyes went like this. They fluttered from birth. So um, I, uh, uh, he stayed with me for three months uh, because his family lived a long way away. And um, right at the beginning, uh, he was sitting across the dinner table from me and I said to him, Lonnie, am I moving? And he looked at me for a long time. And finally he said, no, you're not moving. Now that's a typical response of a patient who is working off of his brain and not his eyes because his eyes were, would have told him that the whole world was moving. But he knew he couldn't survive that way. And he knew I was sitting in a chair and I wasn't moving. So he said, you're not moving. So the next day uh, we went into the therapy room. I took a ball on a string and turned all the lights off in the room, turned on a strobe light and, you know, strobe lights cause motion or stopping motion and all those things. So I said to him, um, uh, is the ball moving or not moving? Because he had no other clues. He didn't know if someone was holding the ball. He didn't. All he could see was the ball. And so um, he said, it's moving because his eyes were moving. 
And so I said, curl your toes, grit your teeth, make a fist, tell me what happens. And the ball stopped moving. And I said, relax, and the ball started moving. So he began to pay attention to his vision. And that was the day that he began to be able to use his eyes and, as I said, pay attention to his vision. So his vision had been 2200, with or without glasses, 2200, which is legally blind. And um, uh, I already told you he was considered unable to learn. So after three months, we had his vision down to 2020. He could hold his eyes still if he wanted to. And I knew that as he developed and got bigger, he would have more and more of an ability to hold his eyes still. And um, he was reading in the top reading group in the first grade. Wow. So that's paying attention to vision because vision has to do ultimately with cognition. Vision is tied in to motor, to proprioception, to audition, and the audition is also a, a two-way um, system. They've discovered just within the last three years that there's central audition and peripheral audition. So interesting things going on. Um, another patient, um, she uh, has an eye that turns out. And so um, we held, uh, she's 13 years old and I'm working with her presently. And we have a string going in front of her. She holds one end of the string here and I have a therapist holding the other end of the string out there. Her mother was standing next to the therapist and um, I was standing on the other side of the therapist and I had another therapist who was behind her with a hand on her back pulling her up and straight because vision has to do with a base of support. So here's everything you need to know about base of support. It starts with your feet. The feet support the hips. The hips support the neck. The neck supports the head. And the head supports the eyes. So if the base of support is off, if you're walking like this, or 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 you're walking like this, however it is, the base of support is off, your eyes are not going to work well. So um, that's why one of my therapists had his hand on her back, straightening her back so that she was erect in the chair she was sitting on. So the eye was out, and I said, um, can you bring your eye in? So we've been working with her for two months so she could bring her eye in. Where could she bring it in? To the bead that was three inches in front of her nose. And I said, okay, what else can you see? Well, you said to look at the bead, so I'm looking at the bead. That's an answer off the brain, okay, off of cognition, not vision. So I hadn't told her to see everything, so she was looking at this. However, looking at this was all she could manage. So I said to her, okay, what's on this side of you? The trampoline. What's on this side of you? The whiteboard. What's, uh, is, that, is that all you see? Well, that's all that's in the room. Well, what's above you? Oh, the ceiling. And what's below you? The floor. Well, can you describe the floor to me? And all the time she's looking at this bead three inches in front of her. And um, so she described the floor. And then, um, now, you know, uh, if you're using two eyes, then the string doesn't appear single. It appears double, coming from the eyes to the bead and then from the bead on out. And there were two yellow beads. Well, there was a red bead, a yellow bead, and a green bead. So if you're looking at the red bead, you should see two strings going out like an X. You should see two yellow beads and two green beads. So all of a sudden, she saw the X, and she saw two yellow beads. We did nothing more than open up her periphery. Now, how do you open a periphery? I always think it's like um, being a Zen Buddhist or something where you're just supposed to sit there and meditate. And 
those monks never, I mean, if I were a monk, I would be jumping up and down, yelling and screaming and saying, but how do I open up my consciousness? So it's like that with periphery. You just let it happen. So we encouraged her to open up and all of a sudden she could, her vision went out to the yellow bead and she saw two red beads, the X and two green beads. So she said, and which means she saw out to the green bead. So now she's out to 24 inches and we did nothing but open up her periphery. This is very unusual work. This is not normal vision therapy. I've been doing vision therapy for years and years, and I never did any vision therapy like this until recently. This is neural, okay? So she said, oh, I see um, two green beads. And she said, and my mother's double too. And then just like that, the eyes swung out and her visual system collapsed. And... <coughs> And I said, what's the matter? And she said, well, my mother's not double. And I said, well, actually, sweetheart, your mother is double. And, and she said to me, no, my mother is single. Just like Lonnie, she reported cognitively what was going on. She did not pay attention to her vision. And her mother said, no, dear, I am actually double. So she got it then, and just like that, the eye swung in. Now, this is not the kind of therapy where you sit there with a hammer or a two-by-four and go, get your eye in, get your eye in, get your eye in. This is very different. This is just allowing it to happen. Very, very different. Opening up the periphery, okay? Uh, another patient I would like to mention to you, his name is Alfred. And uh, I've had him in my office for about five years, and he's autistic. We have taken him a long way. But Alfred always walked like this. And he's about, and he is, 250 pounds, and um, six foot four. His father was a basketball player. And um, he's just... A teddy bear. He's just a love. And so um, we put prisms on him a year ago uh, for the first time. Prisms like this, which I'm going to show you in a little while. Okay? And um, I didn't know what would work with Alfred, just like I don't know what might work with you. And so we started out with two prism diopters, which is just like an itty bitty little prism. There, see? And um, and he just stood there like this, and then I put on four, and then I put on eight, then I put on 10, and then I put on 15, then I put on 20, and then I put on 25. Uh, this is 25, see that? He still stood there with his head down like this. And what these prisms do is they move space so that he should have brought his head up, but he didn't. And then, now I'm doubling up prisms. So I went from 25 to 30. I used 25 and a 5. We got him up to 30. And then I used a 25 and an 8, and I got him up to 33 prism diopters. And all of a sudden, his head flew up. It just flew up. It was quite an experience, and he was able to walk around with his head up. Now, the result of that is that this last February, he rode a bicycle for the first time in his life because you cannot ride a bicycle without having your periphery open. And the, the thing that's interesting about Alfred is he's like the Parkinson's thing. Parkinson's people, patients, are looking at their feet when they walk, very often pulling their right foot along. It's called the Parkinson's shuffle. And that's how Alfred walked, looking at his feet. But now he can work, walk standing up straight and um, ride a bicycle. And um, this uh, last Saturday, when we did therapy on him, now remember, he's an autistic boy. 
And so he could only fixate if I put a target pencil or anything in front of him. I would say, Alfred, look at this. And he could look at it for maximum five seconds. And um, so this last Saturday, we started, now we've got his periphery open, but we started working with his base of support. Remember I said a minute ago that base of support had to do with the feet, supporting the hips, supporting the neck, supporting the head, supporting the eyes. So, you know, I thought we got his head up, but anyway, we, um, we put him on a chair and we put our hand on his back. We got him up nice and straight and put a target in front of him. And he looked at it for five minutes. I just about fell over. I could not believe it. All this time, and we found the magic key. Base of support, open periphery, and then the patient can move his eyes, he can ride a bicycle, he can read, he can do all these things. It's a very unique type of therapy. Uh, remember, I said there's two kinds of vision. Yes. So you said base of support. Uh huh. So once you get the once you get the, the <coughs> head to come up, mm -hmm. and uh, then th what happens when he leaves your office with the base of support that's not there anymore? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I can't do it all. You know who has to do it? A physical therapist, okay. an occupational therapist, or a chiropractic type, or a chiropractor. The 13-year-old girl had seen a chiropractor for the first time last week and came in Saturday straight as a rod. And I called the chiropractor and I said, how was her back? And he, he said, a mess. Now, here's a 13-year-old. Do you think she's kid? You don't think there's a problem? And there was a problem. So and I think yes, too, and this is what we're finding with all of the therapies that we bring to you, whether it be vision or TMJ or uh, you know whatever it is that we're finding that it has to be a team of specialists who yes. understand how the body works. Here's what the physical therapist does. She says, uh, John, I want you to walk across the gymnasium here, and John is frozen in space. And she says, John, walk across the gymnasium here. And John is frozen in place. And then the physical therapist grabs his foot and starts him, and then he can take off. What is missing? Peripheral vision. Peripheral vision. So the physical therapist will do much better if we can open up his periphery. So that would be the same thing in the Parkinson's world then, perhaps, if, if someone is freezing. Precisely. Okay. Absolutely precisely. Yes. So I just wanted to say there are two systems. Frogs are peripheral. You can be a fly and you can sit here and you are a live fly. But the moment you take off and move, you are a, an eaten fly. Okay? Because frogs work off of periphery. Periphery has to do with movement. Periphery is a fast-acting system, central vision is a slow-acting system, and just is for identification. And yet, that's all that happens when we go to get our eyes examined. Okay, you have 20-20 vision, come back later, you know, and that is not it. Uh, getting a pair of glasses to improve your central vision does nothing for Parkinson's. Okay, so who's peripheral? Lions are peripheral. So I really must share with you what happened when I went to Africa. And I was, um, I was in a Jeep with a bunch of people and we, were, we, were, we sat there with the engine off and we were watching a mother cat and her son. So we knew that because the guide told us, you know, that's a mother cat with her son. And they were looking at a group of antelope, okay? And they were just like this. And antelope are peripheral. Deer will stand there until they see movement and they take off. Okay? So 
uh, they, they, they were crouched, and the mother would move about, you know, one paw went out maybe five inches, and the other paw, and the baby, who looked pretty big to me, uh, would go just like the mother. He was just a kid, you know, and then all of a sudden, oh, he couldn't stand it, and he took off, and off went the cantaloupe, uh, cantaloupe, cantaloupe. <laughs> so, um, peripheral, and the mother was like, told him, does he listen? So, you have to understand, now, I want to say, in our lives, we have central vision and peripheral vision. What is central? Central is looking at a problem and saying, I have a problem. And peripheral is looking at the whole picture. And you never know when you look at the whole picture what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, I'm going to show you some videos. I just discovered that my fifth video is apparently on my kitchen sink, and that's the one I love the most. It's uh, a, a video from a doctor on the East Coast who, it's just an incredible video. I'm sorry I don't have it, but I brought four videos of my own patients, which I think you'll enjoy. Um, the first one is of um, Gianna. She's, uh, I believe, six years old in this video, and um, she is the youngest, uh, smallest surviving quintuplet in the world. She was born at under one pound, and she's absolutely wonderful. Uh, full cognition, healthy body, everything's just great. But um, like, like uh, the children who we're talking about, you know, the fact was overlooked that there was a problem with her base of support. So her grandparents came to take the quintuplets on a walk, and that night uh, she cried because her knees hurt, because her knees abrased each other, because she would walk like this and they hurt by the time she came back from the walk. And you will see, we put prism on her, okay? The second one is a woman uh, who has neurological ataxia, and um, it's a genetic disorder. She's one of four siblings, three of them have the problem. Her old, she's 55, I believe. Her older brother is already in a wheelchair and the way she walks is holding on to her husband's arm and looking at her feet. And when um, she got the glasses, I had forgotten to take a video of her when she was in the office, which I try to do. And I drove out to her home, which took me a long time, uh, to take the video. And she had just received the glasses in the mail two hours before I got there. And guess what she and her husband had done for those two hours? They had gone for a two-hour walk, and she was not holding on to her husband or looking at her feet. She had her prison glasses. The third one is a fellow who works as a prison guard. And believe it or not, in order to be a prison, prison guard, you have to be able to do jumping jacks. So the way he did jumping jacks was like this. He could not move, I think it was his left foot. Nobody knew why. He'd had an MRI done, he talked to him. He'd gone to a neurologist, he did everything. They had been chasing this for about a year and when they fell through my front door and uh, put prisms on him and all of a sudden he could move both legs, okay? And uh, the last one is a woman with Parkinson's. And uh, the only problem with that video is I, uh, going through my examination takes a long time and I think she wore out and the drug she was taking, she needed to take another one and so she kind of wears down at the end of the video. But um, I think you'll enjoy them. And they're all short videos? Today? Yes, the whole thing takes like six minutes. Okay. Yeah, is that all right? Terrific, yes. Okay.
right hip up, left hip down, right shoulder down, left shoulder up. Come on. Head leans toward the left shoulder. Turn around, please. And the back. Go straight ahead, sweetheart. Go, go. The back goes from the bottom left to the upper right. And then come back. And come back now. Look at her knees. And turn around and do it again. And back. And turn around. And come this way. And back. That's not hot. That's better? Yeah, that's not hot. And walk slowly now and come on. Yeah. Hi guys. Yeah. Yeah, scissors are gone. Shoulders are straight. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, a lot more stability. Doesn't have to hold on to the walls anymore. Yeah, and she's just had the glasses. <laughs> Two hours. Yeah. Plus, it's at night. I usually have more trouble at night. Oh, yeah, it's night. Go. See, he can only move his left leg to do a jumping jack. Okay, we're putting on two base up. Brings his body erect, brings his feet in. His, he's able to swing his arms. Now he was holding them rigid before. Turn around. Turn around. And stop and do a jumping jack. Go for it, right? Yeah. Okay, tremendous difference. We didn't make that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't believe it. It's so weird. <laughs> this is again with the old glasses on. Come on. And the right shoulders down, the right hips up, dragging the right foot. This is with the new glasses on, the right shoulders up better, the right hips down better and the foot is being picked up. Here with the old glasses, you can see the left eye out a little, and the right eye is uh, has a cataract and vision is 2050, the left eye is 2020. She has uh, no horizontal prism, she has Eight base down in the right eye and five base down in the left eye. Turn around and walk. Turn, walk. Yeah. Once again, right shoulders up. Turn. Come. There. Okay. Okay, yeah, he's moving in. I uh, just want to notice that her eyes look straight and she has a three diopter vertical prism.
on, basically, and is walking better and standing better. And the vertical prism does not show up in the basic exam. It was prescribed just off of posture. It's coming towards me. It's coming towards you? Yes. Is it here? 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 It's a little farther back. It's right there. Right here? Yeah, right there. Can you still get one? Yes. Tell me when it comes to. Still, still one. one? Still one. Still one? Still one. Still one? Still one. Still one. Is it about here? Uh, no, it's a little, go towards you a little bit farther, right there. Right here? No, you're about here. So he's doing base out. He's experiencing silo. Still single. Still one. Still one. Still, Still one. one. Wow. It's getting closer. Still it's one. Getting much smaller. Good. Small in. Still one. Still one. If I oh, move it far. That's the best I can do. I just wanted to uh, end by saying one other thing. Um, I had said to you why is peripheral vision relevant to these problems, and I just want to repeat this. Without the balance of the peripheral process, the focal process will often distort or misrepresent space, which makes the person drag the foot, tip to the side, tip to the front, and the prisms uh, open up the periphery. Um, it is the peripheral process that creates stability in our lives, enabling us to anticipate change related to balance, posture, and movement. So what that means is as you're walking through the jungle and you see a tiger over here, you really have to be able to figure out whether to run or climb a tree. That's all peripheral. Same thing driving your car. You have to be able to see what's out here to save your life. And this paragraph here is one of my very favorite things. Peripheral vision provides the foundation for space and time <coughs> relationships. While embracing the emptiness that supports central awareness. What in the world could that possibly mean? The emptiness of your central awareness? What's that about? Just as opposing mirrors reflect their own emptiness, <coughs> if we had two mirrors like this facing each other, our vision is a mirror reflecting pre-conscious, that's peripheral vision, and conscious, that's central awareness, upon the emptiness of cognition. What that means is when you combine your peripheral awareness with your central awareness, then your brain can cognate, it can think. Vision is the primary source of our information, like 90%, something like that. So spouses, for example, if they disagree, it's because they don't see things the same. And that's what that's about. Your children disagree because they don't see things the same. And when I have a child in my chair and they have really good vision, I turn to the parents and I say, this is a really easy child to live with, isn't it? And they'll say, yes. See, it has to do with vision. Any questions? <coughs>